is a professor of the history of art and architecture from Boston University. She has a, a very distinguished, prolific history of publishing essays and articles, and she's also the 2011 receiver of the College Art Association Distinguished Teaching in Art History Award. Welcome, Patricia Hills. The remarks that I'm making today are an adaptation of an essay I wrote in the book called The Social and the Real Political Art of the 1930s in the Western Hemisphere. And this was edited by Alejandro Andreas, Diana Linden, and Jonathan Weinberg, and published by Pennsylvania State University. As we all know, in the United States of the 1930s, um, the, the Depression lives in the memory as a time when many artists, particularly urban artists, experienced the hardships of unemployment, rental evictions, and empty stomachs and enthusiastically embraced the causes of the working classes. They painted such pictures as you see up there, Isaac Sawyer's Employment Agency, 1937. Notice that it is an integrated scene. One of the characteristics of 1930s artists is to integrate both black, uh, other minority workers, Hispanic, and also white workers together, men and women. Another work is this one by Edward Millman called Flophouse, 1937. Robert Guatheny, The Hitchhiker, 1936. By the mid to late 1930s, government programs were in place to employ artists as artists, as artists. The most extensive was the Federal Art Project, created in August 1935 under the Works Progress Administration. Also created at this time, and uh, the work, the Federal Art Project number one actually consisted of four different divisions. There was the Art Project, the Theater Project, the Writers, and the Music. By 1936, the Federal Art Project was employing over 5,000 people nationwide as artists, models, and arts administrators. And you can see this poster here that gives those statistics that as of November 1st, 1936, that was right before the 1936 election. Moses Sawyer did a picture called Artists on the WPA that gives a little bit of a sense of the way the artists were working. Now the government paid the artists their salaries, but local people, usually community centers, churches, had to supply the spaces where artists were working and also the materials. However, even with the government projects offering many artists some sort of employment, they still gravitated towards the progressive movements, towards socialism, but especially towards communism and the Communist Party. To these artists, the Communist Party seemed to have an analysis, a theory about the causes of the Depression and the failure of capitalists to provide justice, equality, and a decent quality of life for all people. Also, the CP provided courses of action. They knew how to strategize for meetings, galvanize their audience, the workers, and organize demonstrations. As Marxists, those in the CP orbit understood that theory and practice go hand in hand. As to the WPA Federal Art Project, it was often, which was often having cutbacks, artists were had to mount protests against them. Now these leftist artists included Louis Hosewick and William Cropper, both of whom are represented in the exhibition that is, that is over in the library now. 
Uh, both can be said to be very much a part of the movement. Uh, Louis Lozovic was probably in the party. Cropper uh, was not in the party, everyone said, but he certainly could have been because he certainly his, his heart was in what the movement was doing. And these, these are covers of the New Masses. The New Masses was a, a sort of a radical literary journal that was very much influenced by the Communist Party. People who were the editors were also, um, many who were in the party. But this, the New Masses was a major, really a major publication with artists such as, with writers such as Ernest Hemingway and John Steinbeck, who wrote frequently for it. Now both uh, Gropper and also Lazowick were founders of the John Reed Club, an organization of writers and artists who had been hanging out in the offices of the New Masses when they'd then decided to get their own space. Hence, in the late 1929, these writers and artists founded the John Reed Club based on the American journalist who went over and actually uh, witnessed the Russian Revolution. The club grew and eventually had chapters in about 32 different cities. In New York, the artists and the writers met separately. Now, the radical John Reed clubs folded when the Popular Front came in. Now, just to remind everybody about the Popular Front. During the 1930s, the CPUSA changed its political course following the lead of the Soviet Union, which recognized the strength of the fascist onslaught in Europe, and they therefore changed their international strategy. The CP, uh, so, well, the Soviet Union CP, suspended its support of local communist revolution, and instead, the new policy was building a mass movement of progressive organizations in all countries in order to sp uh, confront the spread of fascism. That strategy became known as the Popular Front. Now in the US, that meant, in other words, very briefly, that the CPUSA in the early 1930s considered itself a revolutionary party, unwilling to make alliances with the liberal leadership of other progressive organizations, and expressing itself in the rhetoric of confrontational class struggle. But the second phase, the United Front, and that is really the period that we're talking about with the New Deal. As a consequence of this popular front line, party members and their friends disbanded those organizations deemed narrowly sectarian, such as the John Reed Clubs, and shifted to a rhetoric of conciliation and reform. One of the artist organizations initiated by CP members, but whose membership included many leading centrist intellectuals and liberal intellectuals was the American Artists Congress, which held its first Congress against war and fascism, that was the subtitle, in February of 1936. Historian Lawrence Shorts points out in his book, Marxism and Culture, the CPUSA and Aesthetics in the 1930s, that when the party gave up its independent revolutionary politics for the sake of a united front, quote, the politics of the popular front then became union organizing, anti-fascist organization building, and the agitation of the immediate relief of depression ills. The basic tactic to the strategy was the creation and building of unions. Indeed, 1935 became a busy, busy year for communists assigned to building most more mass organizations and unions. Now already, unemployed artists had banded together to form an artist union. But with the government putting in place the Federal Art Project in August 1935, many of these artists were now employed, although they had issues with the government, like every other group of workers. And they, one of their major publications was Art Front, 
which is a wonderful resource for the, art, the attitudes of artists in the middle years of the 1930s. This is a cover by Stuart Davis, very well known, more, more of an abstract artist, and who was the editor to this cover in 1935. Uh, there is Stuart Davis on the left with his wife Rosalie, very much involved in these uh, in, in demonstrations. I mean, demonstrations were going on all the time. William Gropper, another cover of Art Front, called Artists Stop Those Cuts. As I said, the government, like today, was often laying off workers, for the threat hung over the artist workers that they would be laid off. Now I want to get to the artist Philip Evergood, is to focus on him. He was an artist who was very much part of the movement and part of the union movement. He painted both scenes of the struggle and also racial integration. And he was also instrumental in bringing the artist union into a CIO affiliate, the United American Artists Local 60, of the United Office and Professional Workers of America. Born in New York City in 1901, Philip Evergood was the only child of an aristocratic English woman and an Australian painter, Miles Blaschke. He studied music as a child, and then his mother insisted that he get a proper English education, and he went off to boarding schools, including Eton and Cambridge. In 1921, he went to London to study at the Slade School. Back in New York briefly in 1923, he then returned to Europe, but then came back for good in 1926. He developed a style that is very unique to him, a kind of strange style. Uh, this one is called Reaching for the Bluebird. Now, nothing could be more apolitical than a picture like this. This painting was included in an invitational exhibition held in 1932 at the Museum of Modern Art, an exhibition of artwork curated by Lincoln Kirstein and meant to showcase the skills of New York artists as potential muralists. Diego Rivera was beginning to paint his painting at Rockefeller Center, and American artists were all, were all saying, well, you know, we would like to paint murals too, so it was really meant to showcase Americans. In contrast to Evergood's fantasy, many of the other participants, such as Hugo Gellard, William Gropper, and Ben Shawn, presented controversial political subjects that would tweak the sensibilities of the museum's trustees. And I don't have uh, uh, pictures of these, but there was such a kind of uproar from the trustees that they moved the exhibition to a, a, a dining room that would be inaccessible for anybody to see. Anyway, Evergood considered this exhibition to be a key event of his life, uh, recalling that at this time, quote, and I'm quoting Evergood, I began to search for expression in contemporary life and scene and lost interest in subjects purely drawn from the imagination. So he became good friends with many of these leftist artists. Now the winter of 1932-33 was the worst of the Depression, with high unemployment. Evergood described to John Bauer, then a curator at the Whitney Museum, a major experience he had one night that was like an epiphany. And he says as follows, quote, I went out for a walk down Christopher Street towards the North River. That's the Hudson River. It was about 10 o'clock. I passed the post office and government building at the end of the street and came to a big empty lot with about 50 little shacks on it, all made out of old tin cans, crates, orange boxes, mattresses for roofs. Most of them were not even as tall as a man. You would have to crawl in on hands and knees. Snow was on the ground. A fire was lit, and a group of Negroes and white men were huddled around the fire. These were the outcasts of New York, the outcasts of civilization. 
The only food they had was from garbage cans. The only fire they had was from stocks they picked up around the wharves. I went over to the fire and talked to them. They didn't seem to resent me, and I felt that they were all very cold, so I went through my pockets and brought out two or three dollars and told them to go and get some gin. They bought a big bottle and all had a drink and warmed themselves up. We sat around the fire and talked. They couldn't call themselves by ordinary men, <clears throat> by ordinary names. Old Foot was one, Terrapin was another. They were interesting people, but their tragedy hit me between the eyes because I had never been as close to anything like that before. So then he goes home and he gets his uh, pencils and paper and comes back and he drew this picture. This moment, this experience forever changed Everett's worldview and his art. He later told Forrest Selvin, a historian, whether the background was proletarian or not, there is a point sometimes in people's lives when something comes along to stir them up and change them a bit. I didn't methodically go out and try to become a social painter. The real urge to paint America came when the Depression came and people were actually sitting on the curbs with their tongues hanging out, end quote. My point is that theory and reading about events do not change people's minds. They must experience and hence an internalize events in order to have a change in consciousness. That's why picket lines are so important, not just because it shows the boss that workers have power, but because the worker himself or herself feels the power of belonging to a collective with an outlook bigger than the individual. That experience of solidarity changes, and it changed a great number of these artists in the 1930s. So by the next year, on March of 1933, he then joined the John Reed Club and became more and more sort of involved in the movement. And he began to say, he wrote about his years in 33, 34, began to become interested in the artist's role in society. Social protest art, potential importance of the artist as a propagandist, attended John Reed Club's forums and exhibited work there. Now one of the most striking works that he did in the next few years is Dance Marathon of 1934. I don't really have time to discuss this, but this, can you see it all right? It's, it's a couple, and the, if you look carefully, the man looks like a Latino, and the woman has very, you know, has very white hair, and they're dancing you know, in this dance marathon because they're, they're desperate for money. Uh, there was a very important, you know, there, there were, you know, taxi dancers, marathon dancers was a way of making money, but as I said, I won't go into it. Yeah. All right. In the next few years, Herb Good became more and more involved with progressive artists organization. In December 1936, the Artists Union organized a sit-down strike at the Federal Art Project headquarters in New York to protest cutbacks in the WPA. Artists felt betrayed by President Roosevelt, who had just been reelected in November 1936 in a landslide election in which the unions were very supportive of him. The artists were hoping to petition for a permanent art project. Instead, the government announced that it would cut 2,000 jobs from the art program. Now remember that, that that's a huge amount. Evergood was one of the organizers. Some two, 219 people were arrested. There was then sort of massive demonstrations following. But let me just point out this one. These are, these are pictures that were in the New York Times. Uh, this was when these uh, art workers did their sit-down strike at the WPA uh, the FAP offices. Uh, Evergood later told Bauer, and John Bauer, who was the curator of the Whitney. He said as follows, and here's one that shows the, uh, this shows the New York, how it is in the New York Times. But. 
Okay, quote, I was one of the smaller organizers. Paul Block, the sculptor who was killed in Spain a short time later, was a really brave man and really courageous person in that whole thing. He was conspicuously the revolutionary leader of it, you might say. He stuck his chin right out and put his arm around the post, and they had to defeat him insensible to get him out of, out of there. They beat me insensible, but not because I did anything heroic like that, but just because I was the biggest and standing in the room. Now the demonstrations continued, and uh, here's another picture of a demonstration. Uh, Evergood then did in early 1937 the pink dismissal slip, which shows an artist, it's very much a self-portrait type, you know, looking at his pink slip, you can see his hardest brushes in his hand. But now we get to the uh, sit-down strike. Uh, well, we get beyond the sit-down strike. But it was the experience, his own experience of the 219 sit-down strike was still fresh in his mind when he was jolted by the photographs and news of the police attacking striking workers on the ground, grounds of South Chicago plant of Republic Steel on Memorial Day of 1937, and Ahmed has told us about that. This is a clipping that I found in the Philip Evergood files, and he was very much affected by it. I won't read you, I mean, I won't tell you about, I mean, you know about the, the strike. But let me just show you the picture that resulted in that. Uh, it's a big picture, it shows the policeman coming at the workers. You see the man with the upraised club over on the right is very similar to the picture that is in, that was, you've already seen on the left. There's the man in the middle, you know, and he's fighting off. Notice that the woman uh, next to him, that the man is protecting this Latina woman. In the background between the heads of the two policemen is a black man. There's also a figure there, down there towards the bottom, which very much looks like Philip Evergood and his own experiences of having been beaten by the police. There's a man that's lying on the ground that was in one of the pictures that you saw, a black man who has a vest on. I'm not sure if that picture came out when um, I don't know if that, that man was in it, but a black man lying on the ground. And in the picture over here, he has the American flag in the hand of the black man. And he wanted to stress the fact that to Evergood, it was a peaceful sort of picnic you know, and of course we've just heard that it wasn't exactly a picnic, but certainly there was a kind of festival, you know, I uh, mean the fact that it was on Memorial Day. And then in the lower right corner, there is a hat, you know, the kind of a hat that you wear to a pic picnic, oh, a boat or a little straw hat. And then returning uh, to the picture. Another thing is that if you can notice this, is that the woman there is pregnant, and there is, a, there is a history, of course, of pregnant women sometimes putting themselves at the very front of a demonstration to sort of inspire people. Well, if she's willing to do that, we should also do that. And certainly in the, you know, the history of art, uh, you see that. So, he said, he said later to John Bauer, he said, I think that anybody who hasn't really been beaten up, the po beaten up by the police badly as I have could have painted an American tragedy. And this picture, by the way, is one of the most radically revolutionary pictures of the period. Even though it was done in the so-called popular front period, artists such as Philip Evergood still felt themselves to be anti-capitalist and anti-revolutionary. Now I just want to, I know time is getting short, but I do want to return to, um, to this, this other point about his union activity. Evergood at this time became even more deeply involved in the artist union and labor issues. The summer of 1937, he was elected president of the artist union a post he held from September 37 to September 38. 
the two main jobs had to be accomplished. The first was to affiliate the artist union with a larger union, and the second to push for the federal arts bill, which had been introduced by Congressman John M. Coffey in August 1937. The bill called for a permanent Bureau of Fine Arts, Evergood explained in an article that he wrote to the American Artists Congress, uh, when they, I mean, a, a talk that he gave uh, to the second convention in 1937, quote, artists now look to the establishment of a permanent Bureau of Fine Arts as a logical and necessary step, a secure and stabilized life for themselves and the building of a great American culture. The rhetoric that Evergood used in all of his public statements for the artists' union was one of reform, not revolution. Now through the entire winter and spring, he expended a lot of energy lecturing and promoting this federal arts bill. And they, uh, meanwhile, and this is really interesting, the artists' union committee wrote to members requesting contributions of artworks for a 20 to 30 inch leather bound volume of 50 to 75 drawings, watercolors, and prints that was going to be presented to the, pres the president. And maybe later I can talk a little bit more about this when we're having our panel discussion. But they, they, these artists felt that they would give this portfolio to President Roosevelt and he would see how worthy they were uh, of being, of being uh, financed, you know, and having a permanent art project. So I'm afraid I have to cut off uh, what I'm saying, uh, but his rhetoric in all of this is that, you know, that meanwhile, uh, when he writes to the president, you know, that he feels that the president knows that if they stay in back of him and see that he gets a steady job, this is the American people, they can give him a great culture and also a people's art. Anyway, I have to close but here's another picture uh, that he did in 1938. It's a very complicated picture. It's interesting that the critics on the left really like this picture. The critics for some of the established newspapers thought that the picture was a bit of a mess. But anyway, <laughs> and it is, you know, it's a kind of strange uh, uh, picture. But just to conclude, uh, because of his organizational position as president of the Artists' Union, Evergood was one of a handful of articulate, socially concerned movement artists in a leadership position to influence his fellow artists. He incorporated popular front attitudes and rhetoric into his speeches, and he successfully merged the Artists' Union into this larger union. However, when it came to his own practice as an artist, he followed no directives, nor urgings, no matter which period of the 1930s we examined. The imperatives of Marxist revolution on the one hand, or popular front reform on the other, were less compelling than his desire to paint what he felt. And what he felt was a sum of both personal and collective experiences up to that moment in time. Those experiences provided the mediation through which he could synthesize theory and practice. I'll just end with this picture. It's an integrated scene of a woman in a hospital. She's just had a baby. Her husband is the black man in the background. The baby is very jolly. The workers are happy, and it's a kind of celebration. And it's called New Birth, New Struggle. And that's what his art was all about. Thank you.